You think playing Tears of the Kingdom was overwhelming? I never even reviewed Breath of the Wild, so... We're starting from scratch here. Nintendo as a company are creative, innovative, and not bound to many of the restrictions that other game studios have to face these days. Name me one other company that's allowed to have endless decades of development time on single projects while also allowing their main bad guy to be in charge. Hello. You don't see Square Enix taking orders from Daddy Sorry, although... Um, did you not just see me take out that gnarly beast? Maybe they should? Breath of the Wild had five years to cook. And as a result of Nintendo pouring their hearts into the development time, gamers get this delicious, creamy, hot <laughs> soup of an experience that the gamers just get to... <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. And just savor every single last drop of. And they've done that since release, and they'll continue to do that for years into the future. And to summarize what could easily be a, I don't know, let's just take a guess, three hour, 20 minute, and 42 second YouTube review, Breath of the Wild was, if not one of, the greatest video game ever made, and absolutely my favorite. Almost everybody could agree it was the best game ever made, and there was no beating it. <laughs> Almost. Everybody could agree. There was one guy that disagreed. Tears of the Kingdom also had a five year development time, but using Breath of the Wild as its base, it was able to build upon it and improve upon every element in every single conceivable way. Tears of the Kingdom, more like Tears of the Kingdom. <laughs> The land of Hyrule, the sky above, and the caverns and below. The caverns and below. The echo, caverns below. Echo. Caverns echo. Below. Echo. You're an idiot. You're an idiot. You're an idiot. You're an idiot. I'm an idiot. You're an idiot. You're an idiot. You're an idiot. I've always wanted to do that. Each offering dynamic exploration, creativity, and I swear to God, this is the last distraction before I save Hyrule. It's just that I gotta help this Korra kid get to his friend on the other side of this river and then build a needlessly overcomplicated structure for him. And then that is it. I'll get back on track after I check out that cave over there because I really need more of those frog gems for the weird guy to snack on and a bunch more of the bright gems for the diamond poopers. That makes sense to anyone else? You're an idiot. You're an idiot. When Nintendo created Breath of the Wild, they wanted players to experience a sense of freedom, to go anywhere they wanted right from the start. There was no wrong direction. There was no wrong way to play. You could take a stick straight to Ganon's front door and fight him with the power of God and anime on your side, and no one was gonna stop you. Yeah. There was no need for experience points or leveling up. The entire world was your playground to level up any way you wanted. If something's too hard, forget about it. <laughs> Screw that guy. Go do something else and come back later when you're stronger or more skilled. Uh, or after you can't fire glitch the Master Sword because you saw a YouTube guy do it once. Nintendo didn't just add an open world to Zelda. It defined what an open world could be. Unlike other game franchises that just slap in an open world and hope for the best. It's like Domino's adding wings to their menu. I mean, you guys can barely make a pizza. But then on the other hand, Wingstop got them garlic palms. Tears of the Kingdom will never tell you that you can't do something. It, it, rather, it will always encourage you to try and then allow it to happen, no matter how insane it seems. In so many ways, Breath of the Wild influenced so many great games to come. Elden Ring being one of them, and it's also regarded as one of the best games ever made, by myself included, and its version of an open world echoes that echoes of Breath of the Wild. And with Tears of the Kingdom, Nintendo wanted to take that open world of Zelda and double it. But sadly, they failed. They tripled it, my guy! Leading up to launch, promotional material told us that we were heading up into the sky with new floating platforms appearing over Hyrule. This was exciting and helped quell some fears that this game might just be $70 of DLC. However, uh, 
Nintendo are Pokemon masters at waving one hand over here, but then doing something sneaky down here under the table. Because while we all thought they were playing a blue eyes white dragon, which is still pretty cool, they were actually assembling a freaking whole Exodius right under our Nosidus. The depths below doubling the size of Hyrule with the map being a one for one scale with the land above. I can't tell you, I can't explain to you what it feels like that first time you plummet into the depths, into the darkness below. The pitch black emptiness filled with unknown horrors, secrets and booty cheeks that you can dive into by the way. I don't know if you knew that. I didn't, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know. I didn't try it. I saw it online. I wasn't looking. <clears throat> Tears has three main layers with seamless transitioning between them. It's absolutely breathtaking and pushes this six-year-old dusty console to its limits. The ability to not fall down to the depths of a cave. Well, actually, that's what I'm about to say. The ability to stand at the highest point of the game and 10-point perfect dive all the way down to the lowest stanky depths with seamless transitioning is not only just super fun to do but also showcases the absolute limitless freedom you have to explore this version of Hyrule any way you want. Speaking of diving headfirst into the unknown, I, I think I did just that. I, I'm a little ahead of myself. There's a lot to talk about before we get here. So let's back it up. Tears of the Kingdom begins in the depths. Oh, we're back here again. I guess we didn't back it up very far. Immediately starting you underneath Hyrule Castle with Link and Zelda searching for this mysterious gloom that's been spilling on out and giving people serious case of Ganon 19. <laughs> We learn so much about the entire story in just the first few moments, but we don't understand the depth to it all yet. <laughs> Pun intended. That idea of the soundtrack in Breath of the Wild being more abstract sounds and noises and Miyamoto flicking his cheek and making that wet drip sound, you know, that kind of stuff. To highlight that sporadic and free-flowing exploration is once again improved upon here. With this early part of the game featuring these slow and twisted stretched synthwave chords playing at such an uneasy pace, implying that something might happen, but you're not sure, you don't know, but you, you can't fully at ease yourself just in case something does happen. I'm scared, daddy, sorry. As you begin that final descent towards pure evil, the music begins to grow as they add more and more layers of synth. And then they introduce these sporadic piano keys that start building and building and building and overwhelming the space until silence. What is that? Even though it's short-lived, these moments of walking around Zelda, they're not only awesome as a fan, but they're also so important for the storytelling. Link is Zelda's appointed protector. It's literally his one job, and it's our job too in these early moments of the game. We take on this responsibility and ultimately fail. As Link struggles to reach out for her and then barely manages to even survive himself. And then this mummy just crushes Link, breaking him down to his weakest state, destroying the Master Sword and his right arm in the process. But I mean, jokes on the mummy, I guess. Link's left-handed, so that wouldn't even phase him. What's that? Oh no. Oh yeah, all of this acts as a way of resetting the player's progression. Sure, I'll, I'll give you that. So that a new game can be played, but it's all done in such a way that adds weight to the story. The game doesn't just take the Master Sword away and say, oh man, well, wouldn't you know, Link got all hopped up on Moo Moo Milk and forgot where he put the darn thing. Yeah, rather it showcases how weak and fragile the Master Sword was against this thing. Link at his strongest couldn't beat this guy at his weakest. The blade that shatters so easily against my power 
cannot save you from me. That's why they showed you his hearts that he had them all. This is the most complete version of Link, and you may as well throw a T in front of that, because compared to this guy, he's a twink. Maybe if this Link had this Link's delts. What was Twilight Princess Link benching? The story in Tears of the Kingdom is not only the best we've seen in a Zelda game, but also the saddest. I mean, Tears of the Kingdom, more like Tears of the Kingdom. <laughs> Tears of the Kingdom follows almost exactly the same story beats as Breath of the Wild, but again, does them all better. You know, hit up a few shrines, collect your powers, descend to Hyrule below, visit the four regions, make new besties, beat the big baddie, and then head to the Winchester, grab a pint, and wait for this whole thing to blow over. Yeah, except, uh, not that quickly, because every element is far more ambitious. It really does feel like Tears of the Kingdom is the Breath of the Wild the developers wanted to make, but they were held back by the PU. Also, you know, time. I know it had five years of development, but really, it feels like it had 10 years of total development. Man, I gotta say, if this is what Nintendo can do with a decade of development time, then Metroid Prime 4 has to be looking insane. <laughs> you guys are still making that, right? Right? All right, let's talk about the abilities. This time around, Link gets splat, swoop, sticky, and if we could turn back time. Each of these abilities give Link god-like powers. No, I'm not kidding. It turns you into actual Jesus Christ. Always look on the light side of life. No, oh, I'm serious. Even uh, Ascend, it wasn't actually originally a planned ability for the game. It was a developer debug tool they used while building Tears of the Kingdom. They used it to leave caves quickly. And it, it was a cheat that they would use while making the game. And they decided, why not just give that to the player? Because cheating is fun in video games. Ooh. Big distinction. And that was the inspiration that led to how the rest of the game could be played. So just cheat. It don't matter. Who cares? See, nobody cares. Nice hat. Every puzzle, every shrine, you won't get caught. Nobody's looking. Nintendo wants you to do it. They're begging you. Cheat on us. They say, well, don't like go to PlayStation or Xbox, you know, stay here on Nintendo. But as, as long as you're here, Adultery, baby! As long as you get to the end goal, the game will always give you that satisfying Zelda fanfare sound. Which means you did it right. No matter how you did it, we don't want to know how you did it. <laughs> don't tell us, but you did it. There is no wrong way to play Tears of the Kingdom because cheating is fun. I, it always has been. And I think this is a sign that it is high time that we have to go back to the days of when cheating was not only allowed in video games, but was encouraged. Whether we're talking about literal cheat codes on my old Windows 95 cheese yellow PC build, where I used to put Big Daddy into my Age of Empires to get our friggin' car with rocket launchers, which is funny now that I'm looking at this because it's so similar to what I'm actually doing in Breath of the Wild, or like in The Sims, where I would type in mother Lord, and I would make all the money so quickly, which people are <coughs> also doing in Zelda. But I would do that, and then I would build the best house, uh, my dream house, and then I would make all my Sims shower, and then delete the shower. Don't judge me, I was like 12. Or not even literal cheat codes. What about when you outsmart the game? Like it never feels better than when you're playing Mario Kart and you take a jump off Rainbow Road where you're not supposed to, but you stick the landing anyway and find that shortcut to get you in first place. Or 
Or there was, I, I used to, when I was a kid, I loved playing the Star Wars Phantom Menace game, but I think I was like nine and some of the levels were really hard. There was one platforming part in Gungan City I could never do. So I found this really great hack where I would just cry and my dad would do it. My point is, cheating in games is fun. Nintendo has even given us these tools before in their games. You remember Mario 3? It blew my freaking brain that first time I found the flute. I found it on my own, on accident, and it lets you skip whole levels. And I was like, this has been here the whole time. I've been going through all the levels like a idiot, like a pleb. And this guy knew about it the first time he ever played the game, huh? Also, the first time the game was ever revealed, I call cat. There's a, there, 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 there's a certain level of hubris that I think a developer needs to let go of when they design a game like this. Every little section in Breath of the Wild has puzzles to solve, and they kind of leave around tools for you to do them, and any other video game you would have to use those tools. Those were the tools you were given, do the puzzle, you, 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 you piss ant. But not in this game, baby! Like, it, take this one part of the, it's like the in the wind temple, no spoilers, in the wind temple. There's this thing, it's gonna spin around and it'll open that gate. Now here's what I did, here's what my big brain did. I got a stone slab, I stuck it on there, and then I had a, I had a fan in my inventory that I had brought from like earlier in the game, not even this temple. I just stuck it on there, turned it on, spun it around, Bob's your uncle, I hope not, that'd be really weird, but it worked. And that's not really even the right way of doing it. I could have just used Tullin to do his wind gust and that would have done it too. But I've seen people just spin it around manually and then use recall to make it do it on its own and then that works too. It doesn't matter which way you solve it and you want to know why it doesn't matter? Because of this. As a long time Zelda fan or a fan of any video game series, we all grew up with these fanfare sounds in our games, you know, whether it's Final Fantasy, Pokemon, uh, the heckin' Kirby, Bubsy 3D. These sounds growing up were like a nurturing parent that was telling us we did a good job, you know, giving us a, a delicious, fresh, baked chocolate chip cookie every time we did the right thing that we were supposed to do. These sounds raised us and embedded in our frontal lobes this sensation that we were doing the right thing. It's funny now getting that sound in Zelda because when we used to get it, it was, it was always for doing the right thing, for solving the puzzle in the way the developers intended. But now getting it all these years later, it's like that same nurturing parent being there and congratulating us on our successes, but at the same time, allowing us to spread our wings and do it our way. Sometimes make our own mistakes, but eventually we get there and they're proud of us. This sound reinforces that whatever we did to get here, it was the right thing to do because at least we're here. So again, it's that hubris of the developer that needs to take a back seat. Entire puzzles and areas of this game might be completely skipped by most players finding a way to cheat their way through. And other games would yell at you and get mad and they would be like, no, your mother slaved over that eggplant casserole for like five years, you're gonna eat it. I sit down, shut up. Stuff it in. Nintendo's like, nah, I'll just throw it out. You don't want it. Why would you eat it? You know, we'll go to Wingstop later, get some garlic palms. <laughs> Nintendo is like the cool dad. The abilities, I swear, are almost always there to just help you cheat. Recall can just reverse the flow of time on anything always. And you can use it to your advantage in so many countless ways. And not just when you accidentally drop something off a cliff and want to look at it to bring it back. Even though, did you have you seen the draw distance on this? You can drop things from the sky, essentially down to the ground and still pinpoint get it back. It's, it's, it's crazy. Ultra Hand is Magnetus, Magnesis, <laughs> sorry, Diabetes, if the entire world was metal. <laughs> I like the, the element. But it has an added bonus where you can schluck group everything together. Like everything in the world. You can just super glue. And I mean 
anything. Like I have a pen, I have I an have apple, an apple. Uh, apple pen. That's time. I'm 150 hours into this game, and I still have just as much fun crazy glue sticking things together as I did the very first time I just bleh, two platforms together. <laughs> ah! Once you add in all of the Zonai devices, and there's so many, we'll talk about them later, found around the world, and in Gacha Gotcha ball giant gumball machines, and these are crazy, by the way, they're so satisfying to throw like five massive Zonai charges into and then watch everything spill out and it's so satisfying. It even breaks the frame rates, which is weirdly not even by design. One of the most oddly satisfying things in the game to know that I got so much stuff, the game is breaking. I mean, you can build bridges, boats, cars, scaffolding, pod races, freaking hell in a cell, death cages, gun dams, more like gun dam. It is up to you how crazy or not crazy you get with the building. I mean, you don't have to do it at all, you know? Some players don't, but then other people build 16 wheelers and just hit the open road. I'm gonna ride it all night long. And again, this was Nintendo listening and watching and, and, and feeding off of their players. Some people built entire careers off of the back of Breath of the Wild. Whether it was, you know, trying to cheat their way through the game or building wacky flying platforms out of the very limited resources that they had available to them. Nintendo saw people not only enjoying their game for what it was, but enjoying their game for what it could be. So you know what they did? They said, uh, hey, you wanna build things in Zelda? Well, now you can. You wanna glitch your way through the game to the end? Well, here's a tool that we used to do that. And they, they, they said, hey, you want your weapons to stop breaking? Well, well, we can't do that, but we will give you Fuse, which extends the life of the weapons at least. Also, it makes them crazy strong and you can fuse anything with anything. You don't believe me? Watch this video about it. I have a pen. I have a pen. <laughs> Long pen. Speaking of the fuse ability, I fully believe that had to have added at least a year to the total development time. Anything being able to be fused to your sword, shield, or bow, and each having different abilities and effects that all work cohesively together. I mean, this is even crazier levels than Super Smash Bros. Ultimate and how every character have these crazy move sets and they all somehow work together and they don't break the game. At the start of my playthrough, I'll admit, it was a lot of just fusing pointy long stick to other pointy long stick to make extra long, extra pointy stick, which, to be fair, might have just been me overcompensating. Later, I realized that, yeah, you know all that really cool loot that enemies drop when they die? Oh, you can fuse that to your weapons, and more often than not, it'll make a really cool new sick thing. Like when I got this lizard enemy, I can never pronounce his name. When you kill him and you get his like horn, it turns your, your spear into like a scythe. Ha, I mean, it's even more cool because I, I, I literally took this thing's life with my bare hands, I ripped it, its head and stuck it onto my, it's so cool and I, I'll use it for the next two fights before it breaks. Thank you for your worthy sacrifice, you creature. It'll be fine, I'll be back next blood moon. Minecarts on shields to rail grind. What is this? Jet set radio bombs on shields to get insane height. Ravali's Gale, who? You can keep your Gale, Raval. You can put team rockets on shields if you want to be blasting off again. If you put a gem on a shield, it'll make elemental explosions. Did you go a death ray beam? There's probably so many more things I don't, there's definitely so many more things I don't know about. And, and that players will be discovering for forever to come. And that's before we even get to arrows. You stick an you stick a, an eyeball on an arrow, it'll heat seek homing missile onto enemies. Lemons, 
can shock your enemies. It can put muddle bud things on your, and then you hit, and then the enemy will get all confused and will attack other enemies for you. You can even fuse a stake to an arrow and make a meat missile. And I, it doesn't really do anything except slap your enemies in the face with protein. But I mean, it's, I mean, it's humiliating. No one wants to get pistol whip with another man's meat missile. You'll be fusing so many things to arrows, you'll constantly be scourging around enemy camps and breaking crates and looking behind the couch and under the fridge for just one more arrow. I, I swear arrows have become the rarest and most valuable commodity in this game. It's like the only thing I'll spend money on. Just give me another freaking arrow, man. Please, I'm Jonesing. Hundreds of different kinds of items from enemy drops to just things you find around the world. It, it just creates endless possibilities for your playstyle and how you interact with the world. And it also gives items so much more value. I mean, before, like, enemy parts were just trade bait for me. You know, I wasn't good at cooking with them, and all I would really do is sell them for money, or I guess give them to Kilton so that I could get this freaking sick armor set. That... Why can't you upgrade this, Nintendo? But now, with items having a certain amount of damage attributed to it, that makes them super useful in combat, too. It also gives me so much more reason to want to uh, fight enemies or hunt down certain types because I want to rip out their eyeballs and their rib cages because Link is a savage now and Daddy needs his balls. The bigger and stronger the enemies, the better the drop materials. So the, the Lionels, they're not just a fun, exciting fight anymore. They're also serious weapon buffers. There's nothing more barbaric than, than killing an enemy and getting his heart still beating hard and attaching it to a club and, and then finding another enemy and beating him with it. And yes, be, that was a, a heart joke, like beating. <laughs> Eat your heart out. <laughs> that was another one. <coughs> but then that's not even all of it. Because you get the final ability. Oh, yeah. There's a fifth ability. I know that's the kind of the first real spoiler in the video. There's going to be spoilers. The game's been out for like a month. Get over it. I'm sorry. There's going to be some. So, and this is one. Uh, the auto build. I grossly underestimated how useful auto build was going to be. And I underutilized it for most of my playthrough too. Because at first I was like, oh. Cool, this is awesome. So now I can like build something and it saves in a log and then I can rebuild it whenever I want as long as I have the materials on hand. It will just, it will just stick it all together for me. That's really handy because if I don't have a spare 45 minutes to build a whole 16 wheeler, but I start getting that itch to go trucking, what am I gonna do? So yeah, I thought it was handy. Handy? You idiot, I said to myself a hundred hours later. It's not just handy, it's really handy. Because you don't, you don't have to have the stuff. You don't have to have the stuff. I thought you had to have the stuff. You don't. You can pay in Zonite to fabricate it out of thin air like a 3D printer. If you ever get stuck in a cave because the ceiling's too high, you build your instant scaffolding out of nothing, you climb it, and then you ascend out. Boom, bam, thank you, ma'am. And that's only just one way I can think right now of cheating in this game. There's so many ways to cheat. I'm surprised the game's not endorsed by Tiger Woods. I, don't get me wrong. I loved the abilities in Breath of the Wild. Oh, look at them. I love them. Oh, cute. I'd send them a Valentine's Day card for sure. But they're nothing compared to the abilities in Tears of the Kingdom. It's like cr the freezy water, Cryonis, whatever, cry, 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 the, that one, it froze water. Great, cool. But you couldn't magnesis it or like interact with it in any way. You couldn't freeze time on it. Like, why would you? It doesn't make any sense. But in this game, you can like, ultra hand up something and move it all around and then let go and then recall time on that and it'll follow the path that you moved it around and then while it's doing that you can recall up through it and then jump off of it using it as a moving floating platform you can fuse all these abilities together pun definitely intended to solve puzzles in all these unique and creative and fun ways whether it's to platform a puzzle defeat enemies, or just destroy Korok lives. <laughs> I mean, look at this. I did this one, I put a rocket on him. 
There he goes. They call it a Karakut. He's dead now. <laughs> These abilities are so well thought out in their design, their application in the world and how they work with each other. Even their placement on the selection wheel. Ascend is up. Ultra hand is on the right because you use Link's right arm. Fuse is down because you're typically always looking down at the thing you want to fuse. And then mind-bogglingly left is recall, as in going left, as in backwards on a timeline. Every element of this game is so meticulous, well thought out, incredibly designed. It is a masterpiece. Overwhelming. That's, I think, the main adjective I have seen used to describe Tears of the Kingdom by the general public. See ya! It's definitely accurate. I, for example, am overwhelmed right now, just finding somewhere to start talking about what you actually do in this game. It's kind of a little bit of everything, everywhere, all at once. Yeah, when revisiting Hyrule, Anuma said that they wanted to create something new, but also something similar to Breath of the Wild, because a lot of things in that game were already exactly how they should be. And that the idea of discovering new things in a familiar setting was exciting for them and should excite new players. And it does. I mean, for some players, a little bit too much. Is that a penis? From the start of the game, everything is new. The characters, the abilities, the items, the music, the setting, I mean, everything is yellow now. With really only the most basic gameplay elements remaining the same. You got the physics, the cooking, and destroying the ozone layer. But to be fair, now even those are different because Link hums these cute little Zelda songs while he cooks. <laughs> can make frickin' pizza. Not to mention that now the trees are going down without a fight. I loved exploring the first great sky island at the beginning of the game. It was such a perfect way of reintroducing the game to both new and old players. Once again, doing something that Nintendo has mastered in teaching the player how to play without actually having to tell them anything. Because other than roughly pointing you in the right direction occasionally, this game doesn't hold your hand at all. And yet you just figure it out. And if you're wondering, at the start of the game being so similar to the start of Breath of the Wild, did it feel repetitive at all? Um, uh, I didn't notice because I was too busy doing this. <gasps> So after you spend a few hours up here in the sky, revisiting the Temple of Time, there are so many Easter eggs, nods, direct references to other Zelda games in Tears of the Kingdom, I lost count. And the Temple of Time has been in a bunch of Zelda games, but specifically Ocarina of Time, my favorite Zelda game. But more so than that, this is what it looked like on Ocarina. It, this, this, it's the same. Oh, wow. It's the, it's the same. Oh, there's just, there's so many things are back. You got like likes are back. You got bomb flowers are back. Ganondorf even looks like Ocarina's Ganondorf and does the whole kneeling before the king thing. And King Raru, by the way, you remember the Sage of Light from Ocarina? Guess what that guy's name is? Heckin' Raru. And I, I'm about to lay on a beach and chase pigs right now. Like, I have... <sighs> Sorry, anyway, once you're done up here in the sky, you put the Master Sword onto a pedestal and you send it back through time to Zelda and then you kind of yell at her, hey, send back a sports almanac, but she doesn't hear you, so I guess you're not getting rich. Which is a shame because rupees are a real issue in this game. I played for 150 hours and I have like three. I can't afford anything. I'm broke. I saved Hyrule and I'm broke. Why will no one give me money? Right after you send the Master Sword back, this happens, which... <laughs> After finishing the game, I now realize how cheeky this is, Nintendo. You son of a bitch. Then you jump down to the sky 
and you fall down to the land of Hyrule, and it never ceased to amaze me how seamless this transition is. And it, the draw, the, just the draw distance is insane for the Switch. I mean, as you're falling, you can see all the way from the Gerudo Desert to freaking Goran Mountain, and it's all crystal clear. There's no loading screen or anything. As you fall towards the ground at breakneck speed. <laughs> As a long-time Zelda fan, this makes me happy because I know it's what they wanted from Skyward Sword. You could dive out of the clouds to the ground below, but due to the limitation of the Wii U balance board, huh? the developers weren't able to achieve this seamless descent. So you could only dive at these specific points, but now you got the full thing, baby. It all comes back around. It's moments like these that really make me feel like Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom are the Zelda games that we've just been waiting to get, that Nintendo has been slowly in bits and pieces making across the years, and now we finally get to mesh all of the Zelda puzzle pieces da -da 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 together, and you get Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. I mean, it's not even new news that Nintendo have been pushing their consoles to the limit with what is kind of an open world. Look at Wind Waker, for example. That also had a large open world with no load screens. At least, you know, I didn't see them because I was a little kid and I didn't understand how games work. And I only learned later that the reason why traveling the ocean was so heckin' slow is because the game was loading the next part of the game while you were sailing. I mean, I wasn't smart. I mean, I was a kid. When I was a kid, I thought if I ate a watermelon seed, a watermelon might grow inside me and I'd die. So, you know, I'm lucky I finished high school. <laughs> Just like that, you're back, baby. The old stomping grounds. Now in the first order of business, where are those great fairies? I want to make sure they still have those big personalities. What I love about the first time you land on Hyrule is it's familiar, but as we talked about, very different. And Nintendo were really smart about doing this. The second you even land on the grass of Hyrule, you already have a ton of things in your inventory that you've never had before, like all these wacky Zonai devices, as well as a bunch of other items and weapons, the brand new abilities, a sudden need for a manicure. Not to mention all the sky islands you'll see floating above with debris falling everywhere, a new blank canvas of a world map and a large sense of adventure for both returning and new players. A brand new adventure is about to be. Now, where have you been? So, I mean, are we like dead set on finding Zelda? I mean, I'm not, I'm, just not, I'm not like, I'm not asking for any specific reason. I'm just saying that Link has options. Yeah, it follows a very similar structure, but this time around, Tears of the Kingdom feels like way more full of a game. For starters, NPC characters are scattered everywhere, and they'll have side missions, recipes, juicy goss. I mean, even the most least important NPC, I'm sorry to upset you, you're not important. But even the least important NPCs will still comment on the time of day or even the weather, which helps make the entire world feel so much more alive. There's literally like 57,000, I counted them. Don't test me, I promise. Caves and nooks and crannies to explore. And I've always hated the expression nooks and crannies because it sounds like that part between everybody's leg at the top. It's like a nook and a cranny. <laughs> and then you got the shrines and the puzzles and the challenges, the mini games, the Koroks to abuse relentlessly. It's like the main thing that everybody just agrees is okay to do in this game. Hang them up on a cross, burn them at the altar. You guys are sick. That's my one, actually. I did that one. Pretty proud of that. I, it's just, it's impossible to take a step in any direction without getting distracted, either by the game or by yourself deciding it's time to just build a jet plane for some reason. See you later. Oh my God! 
good. The sense of discovery is unlike anything I've ever experienced in a video game before. I mean, I had so many preconceived notions on how to play Breath of the Wild, and I had to shed so many of those as I played Tears of the Kingdom. And the more tears brained I became, the better my experience was for it. I mean, this is me building a platform on day one like to solve a puzzle, as opposed to me solving something now. And every player is going to play this game so differently. And I think the best example of that is, and this is brilliant by Nintendo, just looking at the sign guy. This guy is so <laughs> stupidly unassuming with his dumb little haircut, but he is a perfect representation oh of the game as a whole. How does each player mush that gooey, squishy little brain meats into each one of his sign puzzles? No two player's structures for any one puzzle is going to ever look the same. And it showcases perfectly that one way or another, everybody is going to be able to beat this game. That is the fastest anyone has ever done it. I don't care what you say. It's just their version of beating the game might look like this or like this or like whatever that is or none of it at all. Because at the end of the day, you don't even have to give this guy a moment of your time. You can completely ignore him and still have a great experience finishing the game. I mean, you would be sadistic to leave this poor little guy out cold and alone and shivering and holding up his sign with that stupid haircut. And I, if I could give one more great example, take a look at the Flux Construct Battles. This enemy is designed perfectly for Tears of the Kingdom because you can use all of your abilities on him in different ways. Ascend, you can start grabbing his little pieces and throwing them away. You can even use recall on him at, in moments. There's, there's so many different ways to approach this battle with the abilities and your items and your weapons. And then at the end of the battle, you even get to use Fuse on this thing that it drops, which I think we can all agree to pretend isn't his spiky schlong. Cause, uh, I mean, what else is it? All the other enemies drop body parts. This is, this is something he had on him. Ribbed for her flesh. <laughs> God and even the familiar story beats feel anything but familiar at times because they're all amplified specifically so this time we have temples which act like old school Zelda dungeons even complete with big badass boss battles at the end and I, I, I know I keep drawing parallels to Ocarina but tell me that some of these bad guys don't look like Ocarina bad guys or just Classic Zelda enemies in general, uh, my fandom is on fire. When Breath of the Wild released, a lot of people complained that there wasn't dungeons, which, I mean, boohoo. We also didn't have Tingle, and I'm pretty sure that guy isn't allowed for five miles of a school zone, so I mean, we can take and leave some things, you know? <laughs> but people hated the Divine Beasts. Like, the, the Divine Beasts, they said, more like the Please Redesign Beasts. Good one you guys that said that. Yeah, I didn't miss the dungeons, though. And it's because I saw it like this. In Breath of the Wild, that game was so open-ended. You could beat it any way you wanted, in any order you wanted. Whereas old school Zelda dungeons were so strict and linear to their own detriment at times, looking at you the water temple. Maybe if that was a little less linear, we all wouldn't have got stuck underwater for hours on end. Often with old Zelda dungeons, you also had to get a specific item from them, like the hookshot or the boomerang in order to solve the dungeon. And then you need that item for the next dungeon. So you always got to do it in a very specific order. And that completely contrasts and goes against what Nintendo were trying to create with Breath of the Wild. And that is where the idea of Divine Beasts came in. These larger puzzles you could solve in any order with whatever items you have on hand. You know, not so much a dungeon, and also, I will admit, not so much fun. They were okay. But now, in Tears of the Kingdom, with all these new Zonai devices and wacky abilities, Nintendo found a way to merge these ideas 
to fuse them <laughs> as it was. How many times can I use the fuse joke? Not so much giving us classic old school strict dungeons, but rather these more open temples that is like a giant puzzle with puzzle pieces lying everywhere or over the ground. But Nintendo were like, yeah, you don't have to pick up the puzzle pieces. You can kind of just mush your own pieces into the puzzle. As long as you do it, it's fine. Have fun. It's like they handed us a 500 piece Lego set and said, just use the next Mega Bloks and Beyblades. I don't care. Just make, make it work somehow. Let it rip. Like when I visited the fire temple, the, the last gong, I couldn't find a way into the stupid t towers, a big tower. And I think I was supposed to get in near the top somehow because I saw layers to it and it was at the bottom, but I couldn't figure it out for like an hour. I was looking everywhere. And then I finally had this dumb thought, a dumb thought that shouldn't work. That wouldn't have worked in any other game. But I, I got one of those fire hydrant things and started spitting all over the lava and like created rocks that I stepped on and I joined them together and made a platform and then I got underneath the tower and I zipped up through it and just got the gong and walked out of the room. <laughs> and that is one of those moments I will remember about this game forever. And it's just how I broke it. Every single aspect of this game has been improved over the last, even something as simple as stables. In the last game, they were just a place to pick up and drop off your horse. But now there is multiple side quests to be found at each stable, as well as a larger ongoing side quest that encourages you to visit every single stable. And at every stable, you'll also find a bunch of characters, wells you can spelunk down and find things on the dogs that you just can't pet. I don't know why you still can't pet them. It is a big flaw, Nintendo, that needs fixing. You can even earn pony points now at stables that you can use to unlock rewards. And the first time you visit a stable, they give you all your old horses for the last game, which means, oh my God, Bluebee! <laughs> I thought you died. Bluebee! Stables weren't even an element of the game that I would think about before, and now they've become such a focal point and one of my favorite parts of the game. It, it also encourages me to use my horse a little more because now with all the Zonai devices, I can just build my own air bike. Or, I mean, I really could just build my own horse, you know? <laughs> Bluebee doesn't let me climb on inside and go for a ride. Huh? Okay. Yeah, no, I heard it. Flying Three, around two, in an airship one. that you built yourself would be fun in any game. But the fact that it's Zelda makes the contrast so much more exciting. Like, yeah, driving 80 miles an hour on a freeway might feel pretty normal, but you do it in a school zone and you really get that rush. Yeah. And don't get me started on some of the wacky things that you guys are building online. It's like we're not even playing the same game half the time. Building is specifically helpful in the depths where you can't bring your horse and believe me i've tried it's brilliant that in a game where they added building they also gave you a whole area of the map that requires you to do so the ground is covered in gloom that'll sap your health which encourages you to get around in other creative ways like building a four by four or a truck or a, i don't know whatever your little stupid brain comes up with you know minecraft is the number one selling third party switch game so i wouldn't be surprised if nintendo took a lot of inspiration from them mine for materials and fight creepy creepers there's a lot to discover down here in the depths activating a light route will light up the area like the fourth of july and for every light route there's an equivalent shrine above which not only makes them easy to find but my god there's so many of them almost every point of interest above there's something to find hidden underneath which really helps make these two worlds feel connected and that's before we even get up into the sky there isn't all that much going on up in the sky. I managed to knock most of it out in a day or two, but I will say there is no wasted space. Every single island will have something going on and most likely be worth the trip. One of my favorite things is finding the old maps, which will then send you back downstairs looking for rarer loot. I spent so much time in the sky and underground that on the rare occasion I actually came out for air and stepped foot on the land of Hyrule, I remembered, oh yeah, 
There's a whole game out here. Oh, but I didn't kill the frog thing. God damn it. I have heard so many people say Breath of the Wild wasn't really for me, but Tears of the Kingdom is incredible. And even I, as a huge fan of Breath of the Wild, have to admit it's gonna be a little tough to go back to that game ever again. It's because it's like this game, but less. This is like so, so, so much less. Like the difference between me and Bob. And I'm not saying it makes Breath of the Wild look bad. I, it could never. That, that's still a 10 out of 10 game. It's just that Tears is genre defying. It's elevated the video game industry and games as a whole. It's unironically created its own tier in the kingdom of Zelda games. Not diminishing the efforts of its predecessors, but setting a new standard for the franchise. It is impossible not to have fun while playing. To not feel smart every time you solve a puzzle. Whether it's something small, like realizing that you can block rain to set something on fire, or something fun, like making a platform and using the physics to launch yourself into oblivion. Trapping NPCs in dead boxes or figuring out difficult shrines before you end up like that one guy in the Resident Evil movie. Or hijacking a Yiga plane. Like, 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 uh, you know what? I don't have a good example for that one. This game has so much content and you are free to do as much of it or as little of it as you want. But however much you do do, you can do it all your way. And yes, I said dude. The amount of Zonai devices Nintendo gave us to mess around with in this game is out of control. They really said, hey, how can we give as many tools as possible to the players to break this fucking game? This is literally a platform that just hovers wherever you want it to go. <laughs> In a game that as so many of the puzzles need platforming, they just gave you a platform. Really? And, and, and look at the sign guys. Sign guys? More like why even try guy? Ooh. Ooh, I probably shouldn't make a joke about cheating and Try guys. I mean, you can take two of these platforms and like 10 year old me in my kitchen playing hot lava on a couple of stools. You can just rotate one after the other and keep hop, hop, hopping along to wherever you want to go until you smack your head into the kitchen counter. Wings, fans, rockets, balloons. Nintendo said, hey, you guys want to fly in this game? Well then fly. I mean, sure, some of these items write themselves and they're a little obvious, but then you have ones like the stabilizer which can really only come from Nintendo playtesting their games from hour on end and realizing that, hey, this might actually help keep some of the wacky, stupid things people create standing upright. Like, it helps when building motorcycles, which, yeah, you can make motorcycles in this game. You don't even need to pay $20 for the DLC. Nintendo just said, you can do it! And then you got all of the killing things, all the, all the, yeah, the death things, like the freeze and the fire and the, and the beams and the rockets that you can use to create massive mechs and killing machines. And you guys really need to go outside and touch some grass. Although some of you literally made lawnmowers to cut the grass. Why? It's, it's like, well, I mean, you could farm for rice, which that's actually really smart. And it doesn't stop there. You got batteries, bombs, mirrors, springs, cooking pots. I mean, and almost all of this can be fused to your weapons or your shields or it's the fuck up. And the most impressive of all of it to me is just the simple unassuming steering stick. You know, it doesn't really do anything on its own, but no matter what you build or what you build on or with, you stick this stick somewhere on it and it will control everything that's attached. This allows you to turn anything into a car, bike, plane, and I mean anything. Once again, this game will never tell you no. Like, 
it maybe it should sometimes like you probably shouldn't turn a korok into a dirt bike but if you really wanted to you can Now, I'm not really someone to look a gift horse in the mouth, but if I was to complain about something in this game, uh, it'd have to be these guys. After completing each temple, the sages will give you a new infinity stone for your gauntlet, so you could... Raise high. And that allows their spirit forms to follow you around, everywhere, all the time and grant you powers. Powers like you got in the first game, but all these ones are like suckier versions of those. Sorry. They're also just a giant pain in the colossal ass to try and use. Give me an ability, anyone, anyone, any one of you. Give me an ability. Please, a anyone. I mean, I'm 150 hours in, and you can't tell me that Sidon's ability is borderline useless. It's just, just, just what's even the point, my guy? Deactivate it, and he'll give you a bubble shield, which can take one hit of damage. But you lose it after a short period of time of not using it, or after attacking. Uh, it just spritz them in the face with water. I go out in my backyard and and splash my dog with more powerful jets of water from our garden hose sprinkler. <laughs> also, to activate any of their abilities, you have to run up to them and give them a super secret Boy Scouts handshake before they'll allow you to use it. Which is super impractical because during fights, they're either dick deep in enemies or just nowhere to be seen or or all grouped up together in a little mighty ducks huddle and you gotta run up to them and just spam a and play the russian roulette of which ability will i get and probably not the right one thanks sidon for spinning on me again i i do like tolan's ability a lot i mean when i'm flying around he'll just snap to my back and gust blow me towards where i'm going it's like a speed boost it's awesome just remember to put Tullin away before you're picking up any good loot. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll just blow it all to Kingdom Come. I will say that they're all great in a fight. I, I like having them all out alongside me. I mean, Tullin will headshot like an absolute champ. So it's worth having them all, even if it's at the cost of about five frames per sage. I mean, that's... Honestly, probably my only complaint in this otherwise near perfect experience, you know. Well, that and maybe the loot, if I was to get real nitpicky. The I loot feels the like a real way, issue. Every single bit. chest either has a decayed weapon or another shield or bow that I just don't need and can't fit. That's all I get. You know what I'd have a lot of? Opals? This game just throws opals at you like that Tic Tacs. You get opals are the true treasure in this game. My god, I'm sick of doing a lot of work for nothing. And if you don't believe me, there's actually a side mission called True Treasure that gives you an opal as a reward. Actually, it gives you two opals! I have no reason to sit here and just rehash the entire story other than to gush over it. So let's do that. It was incredible. <laughs> With twists and turns, so turny and twisty, even Cheeto the Cheetah would be impressed. Whoa, I'ma need a minute. Uh, Nintendo have really outdone themselves. I can't believe this is the same company that in the last 25 years, the only big story development with Mario is seeing his stinky little grippers in the sand. Tears of the Kingdom story is as deeply layered as the world itself. From Link's standpoint, Zelda never even left. She was right there from the moment he failed to save her. And Zelda's story in this game is so sorrowful. Like it's just so sad. The tears of the kingdom are literally her tears. Cause she had she, oh, the, poor, the poor girl. She had to live through a war again, see multiple people she care about 
perish, then turn herself into this dragon in the most painful and shocking Zelda cutscene we've ever been given, and then just left to mindlessly roam the skies of Hyrule for supposedly hundreds, hundreds, thousands of years, just crying, just crying up there. Oh, and all the while, with the Master Sword embedded into her skull as she heals it, and also in, embeds it with light energy to make it stronger than it ever was before. Because yeah, the Master Sword is a canon Super Saiyan now, and this, again, adds to that weight in the story I was talking about. When I said even Ganondorf in his most weakest form could destroy the Master Sword like it was nothing. And now we know that it's been waiting years for Link to find it and use it in the face of pure evil a second time. Oh. And also my legs and my brain and my arms and my butt, they all turn to mush. When I when, when Master Koga, who by the way, I love that they're back in this game. He has such a great arc. I didn't know I needed more Master Koga in, in the sequel, but I did. Also the original person to fall down a chasm. You find him and he tells you where Ganon is and it's like, uh, of course, yeah, of course he's under Hyrule Castle. Of course he is. But on top of that, wait a second. How long has he been there for? Because uh, leading up to the release of the game, we were all wondering if you could go straight to Ganon. That was a big question and Nintendo never talked about it. And then I started playing the game and no one told me that I could go beat Ganon. They were like, go to the four regions. But poor it didn't say anything. This guy didn't say anything. That guy said nothing. That guy's a damn tight lit loser. The whole time, he's just... <coughs> and my first thought then was, wait, so you could you could just rush Ganon, but then the whole, the whole story is about the Master Sword and giving it to Zelda and her sacrificing herself. So wouldn't it be really silly to go beat Ganon with like a stick and the power of God and anime, like I said earlier, and not even use the Master Sword? But then I remember, she, she comes to you at the end of the fight. She comes to your aid. So if you didn't have the Master Sword, you sure as shit do now. And then at the end, when Link wakes up falling and he sees Zelda hurtling down towards the ground. He realizes this is his chance to do what he couldn't before, to save her, to dive after her and catch her. So without even thinking, like, a, like the hero he is, he charges forward, reaching out to her, trying to do what he failed to do before. And then we get this shot that mirrors the same shot from the start of the game, but before, but there was nothing but darkness and despair. Now, there's a blinding, overwhelming light. This one goes out to that one girl that'll always try to save, Princess Zelda. Zelda, I'm a fool. But with your tear, we'll beat this ghoul. Zelda. I'm gonna find you, this is not the end. Zelda, 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 Well, you know, after I've completed every single side quest and also found the Tingle outfit. I'm a busy guy. Zelda, 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 I'll find you. Yana, Bo, Queen, Sonya, and a King Raru. A thousand mobs of moblins couldn't keep me from you. Princess Zelda at the end of the line. Then, 
After 30 years of silence, Link finally opens his mouth and says, My name is Jeff. Zelda Tears of the Kingdom has taught us many things that video games can still surprise us. The correct pronunciation of chasm. A lot of people kept calling this a chasm. I'm not really sure where that came from. And that despite the video game industry so eager to churn out the yearly blockbuster one after another, after another, after another, sometimes it pays to slow down and take your time. As the great Miyamoto once said, the game will be ready when it's ready or something like that, I don't remember. My hope is that more games take inspiration from Tears of the Kingdom. More games that take off the training wheels and allow players to play the game the way they want. But without asking why are we trying to play that way or punishing us for trying to play a way that maybe wasn't intended. Because sometimes cheating is fun. Thirty-two years old. Still a reminder there for myself.